Well, good morning, everyone. Forget those loiterers in the back to come in and take their own pew. <laughs> Have a few announcements um, for you this morning. Obviously, we're in different times, <laughs> and uh, so there's a few things that are coming up. Um, right off, um, Diakon is still meeting this after, or following the service, probably about 11.45 or so. Um, we've also got a lot of stuff on our agenda, so Diakon members, please plan to attend that. Um, unless something further comes up, we are still planning a service next week, um, and the Reverend Mary Holst will be with us. Um, she's actually bringing a, uh, I believe, a soprano soloist with her, um, Ann Comstock, and uh, she's quite an accomplished um, vocalist, so we get to enjoy her next week, um, probably not only for a piece that's part of the sermon, but also for special music. Um, the birthday breakfast tomorrow, there's not a lot of birthdays in March, but we are postponing that. So keep in mind we are not having the birthday breakfast tomorrow. And the Bible study also for this, at least this week, is being postponed. So keep those two events. I'm still, since it's a very small group, but I'm still planning on the movie night for Friday night at 6 p.m. Um, so if you're inclined to want to get out, if you get cabin fever, there'll be just a small group of us for that, but you're welcome to come join us for that. Um, a little extra difference in the service this morning, rather than do a regular collection of the tithes and offerings, the offering plate is just going to be at the back, so if you just, if you want to donate, please um, give your tithe at the end of the service, and we will not be passing the plate for this the regular service. Um, we do welcome Ron Sist with us this morning, a familiar face, and it's good to have him back, and we always enjoy his messages. Are there any other announcements that I miss? If not, let's turn our hearts and be open to God with a minute of silence. Just one more quick announcement that I missed. Um, if you know of anybody um, that's feeling trapped at home and needs um, groceries delivered or some other errands run to the outside world, um, I do have a few volunteers that are willing to do that. So um, please give me their names or um, anything else, or if you're not sure, just and we'll contact them. But we can be sure as Christians reach out and help them in that, in this time. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, we thank you for those who gathered this morning and help us to be open to your message. We ask for prayers throughout, throughout the world as there's many things that are occurring that are trying and difficult. Help us to be loving and kind and help us to be open to your guidance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please read with me the unison invocation reading from Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. 
Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is great and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and the dry land, which his hands have formed. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa, in the wilderness, when your ancestors tested me and put me to the proof, though they had seen me. And now you may stand if you're able, and we'll do uh, Invocation Hymn 608, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah.
O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Say among the nations, the Lord is king. The world is firmly established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the, of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming. He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with the truth. And now, if you're able to please stand for our song of praise, Great is the Lord. today. Uh, I pray that the Lord will use the words that I have prepared, and I ask you to listen with me for the Word of God. We go to John chapter 4. I begin reading in verse 5, and I'll read through verse 30, and then pick up again right at the end of the chapter. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar and near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. A Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? 
Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saved, did you give me a drink? You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give you, that I will give them, will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all these things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, but we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. For you are our rock and our redeemer. And all of the people said, Amen. Reasons for hope have seemed scarce on the ground in America this winter, haven't they? Uh, you know that as well as I do. Between uh, more wintry weather than we here in Colorado are used to enjoying, and the political circus that fills the news these days, and the sudden threat of the coronavirus with its sometimes deadly effect, and all the chill it has put on travel and the economy, and more and more on our everyday lives. Some of you are still sitting too close to each other. <laughs> uh, we seem to have more than our share of chaos this Lenten season, don't we? This week, the very 
daffodils in my yard seem to poke their heads up and then shiver and go back down looking for their sweaters. Add to that the personal struggles and the fears that we bring to church uh, with ourselves this morning. And many of us could use the word of hope today. We scrub our faces, we put on our Sunday clothes, we figure nobody at church will know just how worried we really are. But scripture, like Jesus, comes looking for us right where we are. Once there was a woman who had no hope. She wouldn't have put it that way, of course. Chances are there was even a certain sultry swagger in the way she carried her water jar out from the village to Jacob's well in the noonday heat. Perhaps if you look closely, there was even a, a hint of defiance in the way she boldly brushed past that weary stranger sitting there in the shade by the well. But the truth was, she had given up hope long ago. She didn't want to make that long walk in the noonday heat every day, but she wasn't welcome anymore at the well in the village. Too many snide remarks, too many cruel snubs came her way these days. The averted eyes of the women, the none too subtle leers of the men, all of life had become a, an act to be gotten through, a, a brittle mask to be worn as a defense against the pain. You and I may not think she's much like us, these Samaritan women, woman. We Coloradans like to think of ourselves as open, honest, welcoming people. Colorado is normally an upbeat state. That can be a kind of mask as well. I remember the South of my childhood where it seemed like the African Americans in our town never smiled. They went about their business in my hometown with a look of impassive reserve. As I grew older, I realized that was simply a necessary defense, the look they put on to protect themselves when white people were around. And I think of the Hispanic folk and the Native Americans here in Colorado. Often I see that same reserve, that same protective mask in many of them. That's what you do when you feel like everybody's judging you, when your English isn't good or your family's just barely getting by. And you and I, we like to look as though we've got it together, don't we? Isn't this a nice time? <laughs> so we laugh, we joke with one another, we put on our public faces, we're careful not to let anyone know when we're hurting. We're big believers in American individualism, you and I. And that's fine as far as it goes. But the studies tell us we have built a trap for ourselves these days. We go into our houses or apartments and we close our doors against the world. At home, everybody's got a smartphone or a tablet or a game console or a desktop if you're hopelessly old-fashioned. <laughs> Too many families substitute screen time for conversation. It's easier not to actually talk with one another. Life gets messy when you try to deal with things. So we don't. But, of course, this story is supposed to be about her, not us. Back at the well, she brushes past, eyes averted, ignoring the Jewish stranger, 
going about her lonely business as she has done a thousand noon days before. Till Jesus says, give me a drink of water. Give me a drink of water. It's hard for you and me even to imagine what a big deal that simple sentence was. Jewish men didn't speak to women in the street, not even their own neighbors, not even their own family members. And Jews held Samaritans in contempt they called them the infidels, traitors, a mongrel race who had left the true God and intermarried with pagans. So for reasons of gender and race and religion, Jesus should have ignored her, sat stony-faced while she drew her bucket, filled her jar, and hurried silently away. That's what a respectable man, a good Jew, would have done. That is exactly what she expected. But then he said, give me a drink of water. Jesus never took the easy way out. Never did anything just because it was expected. And for her, that simple question started to change her world. First, he acknowledged her humanity. He does what no Jew has ever done to her before. He speaks to her. He asks her a question. And that question opens a door. First, he recognizes her humanity. Second, something in, her, in his question makes her willing to see what happens next. She dares ask a question of her own. How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? She's more than a little suspicious, of course. Men have noticed her before. They, they always noticed her, but usually just for what they could get out of her. She was used to that. She probably thought, fine, I'll give him a drink and then maybe he'll leave me alone. But Jesus has other ideas. This strange rabbi not only breaks every taboo to start a conversation with her, he doesn't flirt. That would have been the next thing she expected. Instead, he starts a theological discussion. Second, he treats her as an equal. If you'd known who it is that asked of you. Now think about that with me for a moment. You and I live in a day when, at least on the surface, we assume that women and men are equal. We say we believe in equal pay. We support the idea of equality in marriage. We think women ought to be able to do anything in this world they want to do as long as they don't get up and even try to be a preacher or run for president. <laughs> that last statement was irony, by the way. <laughs> but here, 2,000 years and Lord knows how many election cycles before 2020, Jesus of Nazareth sits by Jacob's well in the noonday sun and starts talking theology with a woman no other man he knew would even deign to notice. Even her closest neighbors just saw the town slut. But he, Jesus, saw a child of God. So he talks with her about what's really important. In effect, second, by talking spirituality with her, he treats her as an equal under God. And then third, he gives her a gift. Go call your husband and come back. Third, he tells 
serpent truth. Jesus doesn't preach at her. He offers her what may be the ultimate gift any man could offer a woman in his world or in ours. He offers her the respect of honesty. You've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. Aretha Franklin is right, you see. And by giving the woman at the well simple respect, you know that song, R-E-S-P? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> the respect of believing that she can run her own life, that she has the ability to change, Jesus turns her world upside down. Or maybe he turns it right side <laughs> up. By giving her his respect, he reminds her what it's like to hope. And this story gets interpreted all kinds of ways. It's a story about bigotry and racism. It's a story about breaking down walls, not building them or being passive and allowing them to stand. It's a story about getting past all our cultural and intellectual barriers and getting to the heart of what it really means to worship God. And yes, it is a story that powerfully validates the spiritual equality of women and the mistake we men make any time we fail to recognize that. But honestly, I think there's one more thing you and I ought to notice before we leave that scene at Jacob's well. Maybe the biggest scandal about the Samaritan woman's story from our 21st century perspective is what Jesus does not tell her to do. It's always dangerous, of course, to speak from biblical silence. But think with me for a moment about the end of the story that you and I might have expected and what we got instead. Did you notice? Jesus doesn't actually tell her to kick her latest lover out of the house. He doesn't tell her to join the church or become the president of the Woman's Missionary Society. He just tells her those who really want to worship God will worship in spirit and truth. He tells her what God really wants from all of us. And in the process, he gives her the gift of hope, and then he leaves her to get on with it. And she does. She forgets that she's the town outcast. She promptly goes and finds all those people who have given up on her and tells them what has happened. Come meet the man who told me everything I ever did. She becomes Sychar's hometown evangelist. That's what you do when Jesus treats you right, you see. You start to believe in yourself again. You begin to feel that maybe you can go forward after all. I'd love to see what happened in her life that next month or next year or next decade. We don't know. All we know is that it was enough that her story got told and told and told in the church of Jesus and one day written down. You see, my friends, there is a flaw in the way we Baptists have, all, have often thought about conversion. We like to see it as a 100% change at the moment that Jesus finds us. We uh, recognize that for some of us it can be pretty dramatic. But for most of us, like that woman at the well, Jesus just gets us started. Just gives us the kernel of the story and then trusts us to work it out for ourselves. Hear me carefully, my sisters and brothers. The truth is, there is no clear biblical prescription 
for what you and I ought to do in this national emergency. The word pandemic is not in the New Testament. But the words worship God in spirit and in truth are. Sometimes it's hard for us as Christians to know the right thing to do. Sometimes you and I don't even want to do the next thing we think we ought to do. I don't want to stay home for the next four or six or eight weeks or however long it takes. But here's the good news that's been true ever since that day Jesus met the woman of Sychar in the noonday sun at Jacob's well. God loves you and me right here, right now, just the way we are today. God always has. God always will. Even if you and I don't get it all figured out this next few weeks. Even in times like these, when we sometimes forget what it is to hope, Jesus loves us, Jesus trusts us, Jesus calls us to be as honest with God as we can and as honest with other people and ourselves as we are ready to be. And then hour by hour, Day by day, year after year, in good times and in bad, even when we can't see the future, just like the woman at the well, he helps us find it. And that, my sisters and brothers, is plenty of reason to hope. Stand and sing our hymn, our offertory hymn, number 481.
Lord, we don't really know what to bring you this morning. Our monetary offerings just don't seem to be enough. We know we offer you our thanksgiving that you are here, that you know us, that you hear us and love us as we are. But these days, we find that we wish we could do more to help those around us and around the world. We lift up the people of China, Italy, South Korea, people in New York, and California, and growing numbers here in our own state who suffer from the coronavirus or who simply are paralyzed by fear and don't know what to do next. We ask, Lord, for the presence of your Spirit with those who are ill and those who grieve. We ask for the power of your Spirit with those who lead us in these days. Give them clarity of mind and strength of will, energy of body to do what needs to be done. pray especially for those who are on the front line, the nurses and doctors, technicians who bear so much of the brunt of an outbreak such as this. And we pray for all who will be isolated and feel lonely in the days to come. Accept our prayers, we pray, along with our offerings, and bless them and break them, and use our lives to your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Thank you, Ron, for your thoughtful words of assurance. Now, please join me in the unison closing reading from Romans 5, 1 to 2 and 9. Therefore, we are justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, justified by his blood, and saved from God's wrath. So we rejoice in our hope, share, share the glory of God through Jesus Christ. And now please stand for our closing hymn, It Is Well With My Soul.
other, and you know, smile, and bow to the benediction. And now have no anxiety about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.